we have good news. The videos that we're producing from this are getting nicely used. Not quite 100 views per uh, per episode, but there's definitely folks are using the material. So we know that uh, uh, the, the study that we do here also has an afterlife. And that was the first week or two uh, that folks are watching it. Maybe in the years uh, to come, it'll continue to serve people. So we're really grateful for those who are here together with us live. And uh, we're also grateful that together we can make a study resource that we hope continues to have some value. Songs of praise. And um, uh, here's a list uh, through his research Jonathan has given to us. It's um, uh, quite a few psalms of praise, but uh, he notes that in one sense, they're all psalms of praise. The Greek word psalmos, from which our German word psalm and our English word psalm derive actually means song of praise. So all of these psalms are praise psalms. That's very important um, for us to, to keep in mind. And, um, uh, and, and, and also the, psalm, the psalms close with a majestic chain of five songs of praise, which culminates in the last verse of the Psalter, let everything that has breath praise, the Lord, and here's the, the here's the song, praise the Lord, praise God in the sanctuary, praise Him in His mighty heavens, praise Him for His mighty deeds, praise Him according to His excellent greatness, trumpets, lutes, harps, tambourines and dancing, strings and pipes, cymbals, and not only cymbals, loud clashing cymbals. This is the last song. It's almost like the uh, the finale of a um, of a fireworks display. There you go. You got boom, 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 boom. You've all sort of been there, right? Uh, at these fireworks displays. At the very end, it's just let everything go. Boom, 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 boom. I want to give you uh, two of my sort of attitudes to this last psalm of praise. Uh, uh, share with you two of my own sort of uh, feelings about the psalm as I've sort of read it over the years. Number one is that it's way too noisy for my taste. Uh, you, you know, this uh, comes, uh, I read the Moravian daily texts through the year, and uh, it goes through the psalms once a year. And so by the end of the year, you know, it's already holiday time. You know, you've got, you know, you've got uh, drummer boys and jingle bells and and uh, riding through the woods to grandma's house and all that sort of stuff, going to parties you may not, you know, you may not want to go to, all that noise already. And then I know this psalm is coming up. I just know it, you know, and, and I, so here I hear, oh, here we go. It's one Psalm 150. Let me get my earmuffs on, right? I mean, it's just, it's just so loud. So, so one attitude I have is, oh my goodness, you know, this is not me. This is, I'm such a bookish guy, and this is just, a, you know, way too loud for me. That's one. The other attitude I have is I want to praise like this. You know, I want I want to experience what this is like. I want to lose myself and enter into this world of praise. I want it. I want you. Know, how could how could I how could I how could I experience this? Maybe I go to Jerusalem and attend Jewish weddings. You know, where they have you know all sorts of music and dancing and stomping on glasses and blowing on the shofar. You know, all this sort of noise and ruckus. Maybe I should do that, you know, maybe I, I just want to be part of something like this. So these are my two sort of contradictory attitudes about this finishing fireworks display uh, of the psalm. So here's an attitude uh, that results from the Psalm 150 as a kind of a goal for our praise. It's a destination for us. Uh, you might praise like this already, you know, and, and, um, uh, if you do, maybe I should come over and, and learn from you. I think most of us, um, uh, most of us in Northern, you know, we're like bumps in a log, you know, and, and um, we need to sort of grow in this type, type of unrestrained praise because you know what? That's how it's all going to end. I saw this huge multitude. No one can count from every nation, tribe, people, language, crying in a loud voice salvation belongs to our god and the angels the elders the four living creatures falling all over themselves i'm paraphrasing amen praise and glory to our god
forever and ever. Amen. That's what it's all going to end up in. That's our destination. So praise the Lord that the Psalms end in this way. You know, it starts, it starts out, blessed is the man who doesn't keep counsel in the counsel of the wicked. Uh, Psalm 1.1. 1, 1. It ends in this explosion of praise. May the Lord make the Psalms the sort of the spine of our journey through life. You find yourself in the Psalms. Um, I find myself in, we all find ourselves in the Psalms here, there, because we're headed, where are we headed? We're headed to Psalm 150. We're headed to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. Amen? Amen. The uh, paradigmatic verse that Jonathan has given to us in his study, a very uh, good, very helpful study notes is, Psalm 96, 8, ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. And I just love this word, ascribe. Um, it, uh, you know, when I began to read the scriptures in the ESV version, um, you find this uh, rendering more. I, I, I think... Um, in the ESV, this, this word as, ascribe uh, happens about 30 times. And in the Psalms, it happens here. It happens in 29.1, 29.2, 34, 96.7, and in our passage, 96.8. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. I love this word. I just, I love it. And um, the, the KJV, the King James Version, um, translates this this hebrew word as give go bring ascribe come give out set take in other words these are just sort of a simple imperative uh things that we ought to do and what i love about this is that we are to praise his name independent of feeling um we live in a culture that's too much emphasis on touchy feely. You know, do you feel like you pray? Do you do you feel like praising today? Maybe ten percent. Ascribe to the Lord glory. Are you uh, feeling eighty percent? Well, don't waste it being happy about other things. Ascribe to the Lord glory. So this is a wonderful verse for us to hang our hats on uh, to comprehend praise because we need to separate praise from. Uh, sort of emotional state we're in. This is something that is do God. Praise is do God, and we are here to praise. Uh, and and so so praise really is to be cultivated. It, it is a it is some it's part of our sanctifying growth. It is to be cultivated. Lord, I'm taking baby steps to get to Psalm 150. So I ascribe to you praise now. Let's ascribe praise to the Lord right now. This is what, this is the will of heaven for us. Amen? Amen. Now, um, I've taught my share of, uh, in my academic life through the years, I've, I've taught my share of um, philosophy courses. And um, I want to just share with you one philosophical principle that characterized the, the, the cultures all over the globe before the industrial revolution. In other, words, in other words, before the modern era when we, when the machines redefined everything. Um, it's a very simple philosophical principle. Uh, you know, I, I had a chance to actually teach a course on uh, how Pacific tribal peoples, you know, the, uh, in the Pacific islands, their thoughts follow this principle. Uh, uh, the Native American tribal peoples their, their way of looking at, uh, their thoughts follow this. What is this principle that we have lost since the modern era? It's simply this. Nature does it. Therefore, you should do it. That's it. That's, that is the, that's the principle. That characterized how people lived through millennia before we had the locomotive. You know, we had airplanes where, you know, I can, I can get on a plane and I'm in Spokane, Washington. I can't have dinner in Washington, D.C. tonight. But I mean, that's convenient, but it's very disrespectful of nature. And what, what, what happens is that we, we are disconnected now with God's natural creation, is my point. 
So here's, here's East and West for you. I mean, here's Aristotle, the cause of a son is the father. But wait a minute, the cause of the son is also the S-U-N. So, so, I mean, think about it. We are because the son is, the son gives us life. The son gives um, human beings life. The son gives plants life. The son gives all the world life. And therefore it is a way to organize our ethical practices, uh, our ethical respect, are the way we behave ourselves. This is this is the nature does it. Therefore, you should do it. I mean, it it, it uh, we we look to God's creation. Uh, even Aristotle says there was a prime mover somewhere. What we look to God's creation to to obey and to determine what we ought to do. Confucius, the central star remains in its place, and all the lesser stars revolve around it. Uh, this is a uh, the the basis for Chinese social political theory for 2,500 years, even to today. The, the meaning that the emperor is the central star. Everybody else revolves. All his subordinates revolve around him. The father is the head of the house. All the family revolves around the grandfather or the larger family revolves around. So nature tells us how to behave ourselves in ethical terms, in behavioral terms, and all the world, uh, all of culture flourishes. We've given up on that. We've lost that. And we live in a world now where younger parents, they, they have a kid, they have a baby, they let the baby decide whether or not it's a boy or a girl. I mean, this is, not only is this ridiculous, this is blasphemous because it, it sets aside the created order of things. So when we talk about praise, we need to get back to um, seeing the, the, the creation of all of nature. Why do we ascribe to the Lord glory to his, but why do we praise him? The earth is trembling. The heavens are glad. The earth rejoices. The sea is roaring and everything in the sea is ascribing praise to God. The fields exult, everything in it. Trees and the forest sing for joy and somewhere they're clapping their hands too. The Lord, he comes, he judges the and the ethical, the ethical part. He will judge the world in righteousness. So you better get in line in the way you behave. And the way we behave is to ascribe to the Lord, do his name, the glory do his name, praise him. Praise the Lord, praise the creator of the world. Amen. Flowers are beginning to bloom. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. I just want to show you this. This is how I, I was doing this and I looked out the window. There it is here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, in Northern, spring is coming. This is, oh Lord, this is resurrection life. The, the crab apple tree is blooming and I will bloom too as I go through the winter of death. I will bloom to praise the Lord, because this is resurrection life. This is your creation. And Lord Jesus, I am your creation. Praise you, because I see this picture of resurrection. Okay, let's go back to it. Um, spring, praise the Lord. Summer, the fields are ripe with harvest. Bring an offering into his courts. Fall, oh, because beautiful shades of autumn. I tremble before you, because the earth trembles for your faithfulness through the years. Winter, this is Wendell Berry, the, the poet, the naturalist, the farmer, the horticulturalist, uh, the Christian professor. It is impossible to describe topsoil scientifically, although it has inert qualities. Even a handful of topsoil has, is full of living creatures. It is making life out of death. Not very long ago, we would call this miraculous. When he means not very long ago is before the modern modernist and postmodernist ideas took over. You see that crab apple tree blooming. You are just filled with praise because that's you. That's that's a promise of a resurrection. I mean, read the second half of First Corinthians 15. I mean, we fall into the ground. We come up glorious. Praise the Lord. Praise God. I had fun putting this together. I'm sorry if I sound too excited. 
and there it is again. I mean, yeah, it's all, it's just bursting forth. Praise the Lord in his creation. Amen. So uh, that's it. I, I, Jonathan points out that there are three major traits in Psalms of praise. I think I've done the creation piece of it. Um, we, uh, there is praise the Lord for deliverance from difficult circumstances. This is the reason for praise. There's pray, give, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name because it's due him. I mean, it, it just makes perfect sense. Just you better ascribe. What, you, what, you're not feeling good today? You don't feel like praising? It doesn't matter. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Amen. Amen. This is cultivating us to journey through, journey through the Psalms as a journey of our life. And it's going to culminate in Psalm 150, like it or like not. I mean, you know, for bookworms like me, uh, it, it, uh, you know, it, it, it's not, we're not going to be up there in, in, in Revelation 7 reading theology books. We're just not going to be doing that. We're going to be praising the Lord. So, um, I have a suggestion for a breakout session. Um, if you have your Bible, please get a Bible, uh, uh, whether it's on your phone or, or your Bible. And also on a sheet of paper, just jot down these three traits, okay? We're going to look at Psalm 147. Uh, this, is one, this is one of the concluding Psalms of praise. It's not the 150. It's not as noisy as 150, but it, 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 it's just, um, it, you know, it's, I mean, it's, what can I say? It's it's beautiful. Um, and and what I would like to suggest that we do in Psalm 147 in our groups is to uh, so I've done so I've done I've done this. Uh, here it is. Actually, actually um, I, you know, here are the passages that pertain to the creation. Uh, he covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He gives the beasts their food and so on and so forth. So, so that's the part of the psalm that I've sort of covered in the in the natural creation. And for this exercise, um, I would love what I would like for us to do is find the discuss the passages in Psalm one forty seven that is the deliverance from difficult circumstances, and also the parts of Psalm one forty the verses in one Psalm one forty seven that is simply ascribing glory to His name. For the sake of the video, I you know I've done this. I mean, this is what it looks like. But so here it is for the video. But I want all of us to to do it. So um, if that's clear, let's divide up in maybe two groups. Perfect. Then just a little past the half hour, you'll see the the note in your rooms that you'll be called back, and the rooms are now open. Thank you so much. So we're so glad you're back with us. I trust that was a um, really beneficial uh, conversation as you put your heads together. I just love community Bible study. I don't know why we haven't been doing this a lot longer. You just get to see the Bible in different ways uh, when it's presented by a different personality, somebody that we get, get to know. So thank you so much, David, for teaching us. That was really, really beautiful. All right, everybody, I have a quiz for you. And once again, I relied on my virtual reality assistant to put it together. I had to do some significant editing this time, but it worked okay. And I've got a different structure. What is the act of confessing sins and turning away from seeking forgiveness from God? Eight for eight answered answer that as repentance. Okay, so B, a set of Psalms in the Bible that explicitly address themes of repentance and confession. Penitential Psalms, eight for eight got that correct. Number C, the practice of interpreting psalms by imagining oneself as the speaker, allowing for deeper personalization. And we've got personalizing the psalm, the majority answer, but also some thought Psalm 51. Psalm that contained prayer and prayers for justice and curses against the enemies, often using strong language. Yep, a unanimous answer for imprecatory psalms, practice of slow and devotional reading of scripture involving quiet reflection and uh, prayerful engagement. Great, Lectio Divina. Psalm known for its expression of repentance and plea for mercy, often attributed to David, Psalm 51. Great. And uh, the fill in the blanks there, we were looking for, David highlighted the importance of blank in repentance, corporate repentance, emphasizing the collective turning away from sin within a community. And the third question, the facilitator emphasized the importance of approaching God in, in repentance with a broken 
spirit and a contrite heart. Great, everybody. I hope that was useful. Thanks for your patience through through the different format. It's my joy to dive into part five here in this menu, the Thanksgiving Psalms. So um, let's dive straight in. The Thanksgiving Psalms, um, we only have about 12 of 150. So this is the next smallest uh, grouping of Psalms. The, the penitential Psalms, six penitential Psalms are the very smallest of these classes that we use in this, um, in this lecture series. Uh, but the Songs of Thanksgiving would be the second smallest group. Only 12 or 8% of the 150 Psalms are Psalms of Thanksgiving. Um, what are these Psalms of Thanksgiving? Well, they're expressions of thanks to God for what he has done. And that brings us categorically really close to the Psalms of Praise. Um, just as there were different subsets of Psalms of Lament, Penitential Psalms is a type of Psalm of Lament, the Imprecatory Psalms is a type of Psalm of Lament, we could also categorize the Psalms of Thanksgiving as a subset of the type of, of a Praise Psalm. The Praise Psalms uh, are thanking God or delighting in God for what he has done, and some of those psalms will specifically mention specific things that God has done or put a, sp uh, a special emphasis on thanksgiving. Paradigmatic verse, praise the Lord, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Now, there is a very close relationship between the psalms of thanksgiving and the psalms of praise. And... um. Because I wanted to be, uh, tr I wanted to the best of my ability to sort out the Psalms the way that David or another of the ancient um, um, Hebrews would have conceptualized this literature. And the, the terminology that we have in Hebrew for to thank God or to praise God is very related. So sometimes in our English Bibles, we'll have one term or another translated either thanksgiving or praise. The two, if I can use a technical term here, the two semantic fields of thanks, what it means to give thanks and what it means to praise God, those are overlapping categories according to the Hebrew terminology. We can think of praise and thanks as quite separate things in our minds, but the Hebrew terms referring to these acts of thanking God or praising God have overlapping fields of meaning. So it's difficult. It, our distinction between thanksgiving and praise is not the Hebrew distinction. Here are the two primary words, and um, I'll try to justify a distinction, but then I think we can actually get some uh, theological value out of the closeness of this relationship. So stick with me here for a moment. The Hebrew word, which is the primary word for to praise, is halal. And you will already know something about that word because that is the word in which uh, we have the expression hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so halal is the basic verb for to praise. And that word shows up a lot in the Psalms. Let me get my statistics right. It shows up 123 times in the Old Testament and 88 times are in the Psalms. So I'm just going to show you very quickly because I think a lot of you... Uh, uh, you do Bible study all the time. I happen to use a tool called Logos. And so when I was gathering statistics on the, the number of times that different biblical words occur here, I was using this tool. And I'm just going to scroll through this option so you can see what's going on. You can see that in each of these cases, this Hebrew word here, halal, is used. And here are the English Standard Version Bible passages to the, to the left. And suddenly when we get to the Psalms, this becomes a very, very busy uh, uh, data sheet. Suddenly you can see how often this word is occurring in the Psalms. And to David's point in the first half of the hour, look at how often this word shows up, especially in the last five Psalms. Wow, it only shows up in the whole Old Testament 123 times. And about 23 of those times are in the last five Psalms. Look at how many times it occurs in Psalm 150 alone. Praise the Lord, praise in the sanctuary, praise him. Okay, so that's the basic word to praise. And there's a noun, a, um, a from that verb as well. Um, it won't take you through the noun necessarily, but there's, there's a verb and a noun set that refer to praise. Now, there's also a, a word that effectively means thanks, but it has a pretty broad sense. Um, it's not just to thank or to express gratitude. Yada is the term there, yada. 
that yod is like a y so i imagine somebody saying uh, beginning of the word there with the, a Y. Yada. To give thanks, really it means to, to cast or to throw. That's its most basic meaning or its, uh, its initial meaning. But then in a certain uh, verb form, it can also mean to give thanks, to laud, to praise, or to confess, that is to acknowledge. This word, the word which will often be translated thanks in our Old Testaments. It occurs 110 times in the Old Testament and 73 times in the Psalms. So once again, both of these words are super popular in the Psalms. And sometimes um, they show up very, very frequently in the Psalms. For example, if you just do a word search, you're going to find that Psalms 105, 106, and 107 are a special collection of Psalms. And uh, go ahead, if you have a scripture and you want to turn there, unfortunately, I don't have a slide to illustrate this. So you can just turn to the biblical passages and we can very briefly look over these biblical passages together. A simple word search that that I, um, for Yada will take you back to a very popular place for the expression of this term, thanksgiving. And we'll see that Psalms 105, 106, and 107 are uh, use this term quite a lot. Now, what's interesting here, too, is that these psalms are very long. This is, in fact, the fifth, sixth, and seventh longest psalms, uh, psalms in the Psalter. It, the psalms are 45, 48, and 43 verses long, so they're relatively long psalms. And um, we'll have a repeated phrase. Each one of these psalms starts out with a call for thanksgiving. So we will look at the first verse of each of these psalms. Psalm 105, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. And then what happens in Psalm 105 is this long uh, recitation of the way that God has been faithful to Israel, especially in the very earliest years. Uh, so this is this is a psalm that celebrates God's faithfulness to, to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Swift, switch over with me to the first verse of Psalm 106. Praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And then this, this psalm is a very long catalog of God's goodness to Israel, a few years later, after the patriarchs, in the time of Moses. And the psalm is so long because the, the psalmist is going to take quite a bit of time to, to recite specific happenings in the life of Israel. Look at the first verse also of uh, Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And that psalm will repeat that as a chorus. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And the psalm is, again, a very long reciting of God's goodness to Israel through the wilderness wanderings. So there's also a chronological development in these songs. But th this shows us maybe what uh, the songs of Thanksgiving are. Thanking God for the way that he has cared for and been faithful to the people of Israel. Now quickly flop over, because I guess we're going to do a little page turning here. Quickly turn over to Psalm 118. And I'm going to show you two more very uh, very special examples of a psalm of thanksgiving. Again, we don't have too many of them, but the ones that we do have a, a fairly consistent category of, of reciting the deeds of the Lord and, and calling the people to thank God. Psalm 118, maybe this is an even clearer example of a song of thanksgiving. It begins, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Uh, and then we have that repeated too. His steadfast love endures forever throughout the psalm. Look also at Psalm 136, and then you, and then I'll stop having you flip through the psalms uh, with me. We'll come back in a moment. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And then this of this of all the other Thanksgiving psalms has the the most rigid structure. And here you can just look. And you can see the second half of each of these verses is for his steadfast love endures forever. Um, so again, it's a reciting of the things that in this case, God's victory over Pharaoh at the Red Sea. And there's details of that uh, war given and there's details of God's victory there for his people. But the refrain there is for his steadfast love endures forever. So. If we're trying to get, again, it's not a big category of Psalms. We don't have that many examples. I've just shown you maybe the five most um, 
the most remarkable examples of Thanksgiving Psalms in the whole Psalter. Um, but the character would be that in give we give thanks for what ha God has done. It's we're giving a testimony, as it were, for the things that God has done. Now, I've got a few more verses and then a reflection for us as well. Um, I do think is I, I was intrigued with this category again. Is it is it uh, justified to separate out the 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 Thanksgiving Psalms from the other Psalms of praise? And I think that that is the best solution. When we look back at some of the literature that are about the Psalms or shed light on what was taking place in temple worship during the time of David. Again, the authors will will categorize thanksgiving and praise differently, even though they're very related uh, uh, categories. For example, First Chronicles twenty five three of of Jeduthun, the sons of Jeduthun, Galiel, Zeri, Jeshia, Shimai, Hashabiah, and Mathithiah, six under the direction of their father Jeduthun, who prophesied with the lyre in thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. I was puzzling over that. Why the separation of thanksgiving and praise to the Lord? We have other examples too, where in the description of the temple worship, those are left as separate categories. Nehemiah 12, 46, for example, for long ago in the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. All right, I'm slowly being won over. I think these probably were separate categories or may well have been separate categories of Psalms. Last example would be 1 Chronicles 16.4. Then he, that's David, after the ark was brought back, uh, recaptured by the Israelites, then David appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, the word there meaning essentially to remember, to thank and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay, now the reason why I allow us to spend some good time puzzling over this relationship between thanking and praise is because I really do think that there's a there's a fruitfulness there. Um, and here's the lesson that I draw from this reflection. Um, Thanksgiving is maybe one of the most simple forms of prayer. When teaching communities to pray, when teaching children to pray, thankfulness is is a, a, a hook on our human experience that very often can draw us into prayer. What I mean by a hook is it's a, it, it'll, it will alert us to the presence of God very often in our lives. Most people can experience thanks, thankfulness, and appreciate the goodness of expressing thanks. Uh, my family, since 2019, has practiced Shabbat. It was something that happened when I was in Israel in 2019. I was uh, away from my family, I, I had yet, the, my children were very young at the time. I was coming back. I was looking for gifts to bring back to my children. So I was going over to some stores. It was Friday afternoon, about two or three in the afternoon, and shops were closing up. And I was a, a workaholic at the time, and I was um, planning all my time out so that that uh, that I could get everything done that I was hoping to get done. And I was, I had a million things that I was trying to do on my list and I was going to go get some gifts and then run off to the, my other errands. And as the stores around Jerusalem were all closing up and I couldn't get anything done, life ground to a halt. And I was in a very frustrated space, but actually that moment changed my life. The only thing I could bring back for my girls that year was uh, chocolate bars because there was a gas station that had, uh, that did not close over Shabbat. And I was able to get some Israeli chocolate to bring home. But it was a very frustrating experience to experience Shabbat in Israel and to be uh, sort of blindsided uh, by what that means uh, in commercial life. Well, anyway, I uh, took my lesson. I realized that I needed to change some things in my life and started practicing Shabbat. We've been pra practicing Shabbat as a family for about four years now. And we love to invite other people over to celebrate Shabbat with us. And uh, whether they're Christian, whether they're non-religious people at all, um, expressing gratitude is something that we can do as a community. So if we're if we're just as a family, we might have a more uh, a more in-depth prayer service. Uh, we might spend more time uh, working over traditional pieces of scripture, etc. But if we have secular people with us or people who aren't people of faith, still, we can light candles and express gratitude. That's something that really anybody can do. So gratitude is really the first 
uh, for many people, it's a very first step in becoming aware of God's presence, sitting around a Thanksgiving table, Thanksgiving, the North American uh, holiday, sitting around that table and uh, feeling a sense of gratitude and wondering, okay, who can I, who, to whom can I direct this gratitude? And it, it's, a, it's an open door to contemplate the action of God in our lives. So there's a reason why praise and thanksgiving uh, may be overlapping categories. We begin by th feeling thankfulness for what God has done, but we can transition from that. It's an open road to transitioning from experiencing the benefit and the thankfulness for this gift, moving to the giver. I have experienced something in my life that I can be thankful for. And it's, it's just a pivot from that to realize, okay, and it is the goodness of God that has supplied this. What, what is it that I'm thanking God for in my heart? I can turn, uh, it's, it's just a few degrees from that to, of turning to realize, okay, God's, God has provided that. What does that say about his, uh, his goodness to me, his character, his love for me? I think there are three things going on in an experience of gratitude. Really, there are these three elements. There's memory, there's acceptance, and there's relationship. Um, the first thing that has to take place when we experience thanksgiving uh, or when we say, uh, when we express our thanks to God, is it's an act of memory. Thankfulness is first and foremost an act of memory. And just as any other act of memory, um, um, if you really want to experience the emotion of that memory, you can't move too fast. Um, so this is a temptation. When I am praying prayers of thanks to God, I can start listing. And that's really that's really the wrong way to pray thanksgiving. Um, um, if I'm praying and I'm naming the things that for for which I'm grateful to God, but I'm moving too quickly, my heart can't engage with those. I've heard it said um, that it takes about 20 or 30 seconds for an idea to start to connect to the emotion. So if you if you want to experience gratitude as an emotion of thankfulness, you, you can't move too quickly through that list. You're gonna have to stop and focus on one element, and sort of pick it apart a bit and give your heart time to catch up with that. So first of all, uh, thankfulness is an act of memory. Um, secondly, it's an act of acceptance. Um, it's very, very difficult, um, maybe impossible, for us to be thankful for things that we reject. And that, that means that there are certainly things in life that we are not ready to be thankful for. Uh, whatever our life circumstances, whatever our life history, there are, there are things in that biography that we are working on being grateful for, but can't really uh, express a full-hearted gratitude. But there's so many things that we can, um, there's, there's so much low-hanging low fruit in our lives where we can select um, those things and, and show proper gratitude for them and, and accept them. And the acceptance will help us process those, it, uh, help us to move beyond hurt, uh, and help us to move into opportunity, just to live from a place of spiritual health. The act, the thankfulness is an act of acceptance. And then lastly, gratitude is intrinsically relational. So we all know what it is to give someone a gift, maybe a child around Christmas or a birthday. And we, we've seen different responses. We've seen the one response, which is the quick opening of the package and the, oh, that's nice. And then the quickly moving on to something else. And sure, that happens. We love our kids anyway. But it's not the response we're looking for. The response we're looking for is oh, the delight in the eyes the, the clear acceptance of that gift. And then what? The running straight from the gift to give grandpa or grandma or mom or dad or whoever a big hug and saying, thank you. That's the response we're hoping for. And I certainly imagine that's also the response that God is looking for us too. Gratitude is an intrinsically relational activity. Here's what I'd like us to do. Um, I'd like us to share testimonies with one another very quickly. I'll share one all in about 90 seconds, and then I'll and then I'll turn it over to um, uh, you all to share testimonies in a round. Um, sharing testimonies um, 
isn't necessarily something that we do uh, in all different Christian traditions. I've learned uh, this through Pentecostal groups. Pentecostals are pretty good at sharing testimonies, and it's something that really belongs in the broader uh, Christian tradition. We we all ought to be sharing testimonies of what God is doing in our lives frequently and uh, and gratefully. Here's one testimony. It came. Uh, my family uh, moved from Chicago, Illinois, to Germany. Uh, just after the COVID pandemic. So it was in the beginning of that time that we began wondering whether we were going to move. And then we moved in the summer of 2021 to uh, Germany. And my wife is from Germany. Uh, so she did have, of course, experience living here and being educated here. Still to our family, it seemed like an enormous transition. So many, so many unknowns. You put all your belongings in the container ship. It sails away. They have your money and your belongings. You're completely helpless. <laughs> okay, so we felt, we felt, uh, we felt vulnerable. And um, and God came through in some amazing ways. My little girl, um, who was about four years old at the time, she developed a prayer that she would say iteratively. Whenever we'd sit down and pray as a family, she'd pray the German equivalent of God, make everything ready so that when we come, everything's ready for us. And she just had that prayer in her heart. She would just pray that every time that she had an opportunity to pray. pray. And then, for example, when we it's very difficult to arrange a, a housing from another country. Housing units were very, uh, uh, there were very few units to be had here in Marburg. The, the market was very, very tight. People were not necessarily willing to trust people coming from another country that they would be able to, uh, um, that was going to be a difficult transition to gain trust with a landlord. Uh, but a unit before it came out on the market, through so many circumstances that I can't recite here, but through God things, through God incidences, the right connection came together many stages long, and and we were able to get a, a really a perfect place for us before it even dropped on the market. Uh, we were just so so thankful, and um, we we were praying into that. God, would you make this happen? And gratitude is an act of memory. It would be so like us to simply move on with our business and uh, the other things that are calling for our time and attention and to forget, to stop, to, not to stop um, and not to remember, but to forget what God has done. And giving a testimony is uh, trying to be like that one leper that Jesus healed. There were 10 lepers Jesus healed in Luke 19. Only one came back and Jesus called them on that. Look, guys. <laughs> I healed you all. Why are only one of you coming back to thank me? And um, we do not want to be the nine lepers. We want to be. We want to be expressing thankfulness to God for what He's done. That requires mindfulness. That requires an exercise of memory. That requires um, taking the time to share and to recall the good things that the Lord has done, like Psalm 105 and 106 and 107 do taking the time to go through those uh, many things that the Lord has done for us.